Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Jackson Crawford. With my fourth book of Old Norse translations forthcoming from Hackett Publishing Company, this one includes the Saga of Hervor and Haithrek, also known as the Saga of Her Haithrek the Wise, as well as the Saga of Rolf Kraki and his Champions, I get asked pretty often whether my translations also include the original Old Norse text. Well, with one exception, the Wanderers haul them all, they do not. And in this video, what I want to do is explain why, and also explain where you can find some of the resources that you might need if you are trying to track down and read these texts in the original Old Norse. First of all, let me plug a video that I think is among my most drastically underappreciated, called From the Manuscript to You. In that video, what I did was explain how a page of an Old Norse manuscript, in that case the Codex Regius of the Poetic Edda, is taken from what's written in medieval calligraphy paleography on the page with all of its abbreviations and such and turned into the finished product that you see on the page of a book like my Wanders Halvamal. Now, I mentioned that the Wanders Halvamal is an exception to the rule that my translations don't include the original Old Norse text. Why is that? Well, it was part of the raison d'etre for the Wanders Halvamal in the first place. Right, we wanted to present um, kind of a full experience of Haldemol in that book my publisher Hackett and I did. Um, not only my revised and improved translation with notes to explain why I made the choices that I did and you know what there are questions and controversies about in the text, but also a chance to present sort of my Old Norse text of Haldemol. Now to some I can suppose that that sounds a little bit strange. Your text of Haldemol, right? Isn't there one text of Haldemol? Yes there is in a sense, given that it's only preserved in one place in the Codex Regius or Konungsbok manuscript, but that manuscript if presented to you, if that, that text if presented to you if I were to present that text to you in exactly the form that it's in in the manuscript, it would be basically unusable to you, right? Let's take a look at how just one stanza of Halvamal looks in the Codex Regis of the Poetiketa. This is stanza 39. I picked this more or less at random, um, but it has a lot of uh, good example phenomena to talk about. Now, what you see there, I would read and my edited text from uh, the Wanderers of Mall this way. Fan ka ek mildan man eva swa matar godan at ei veri thigya thegit eva sins fjor swa gjavlan at leiv se leun ep thegi. Now, the insular Carolingian hand, the uh, font, if you will, used in the Codex Regis manuscript is actually pretty legible, so you can probably follow along with a fair amount of that. And if you did, you probably see that not all of the syllables that I read are readily appreciable right there, right? So that's because medieval scribes wanted to use as much space as they could, so they made use of many kinds of abbreviations, both symbols that represent sometimes entire words or syllables, and um, little shorthands for cutting down on how long a word, how much space a word takes up on a manuscript. Because remember, these are written on vellum, which means calfskin, so you have got to have a dead calf for every, I mean, I guess depending on the size of the calf, 8 to 16 pages or so. Probably seldom 16. Um, I guess I've never tried to make a book out of a calf. Anyway, you have only so much space, right? 
and um, there's not limitless paper. There's no, you know, medieval Icelandic office depot to go buy paper at. So they want to take up as little space as they can. Now, I could simply reproduce exactly what's here in the manuscript, as I said, but that's not actually necessarily very usable to you. What we've got are tons of abbreviations. So we see, for example, there is the famous tittle, a little lightning strike looking thing that you see over the V in Vari. What that stands for is that an ER or in Old Norse ash R has been left out after the uh, letter that it's written over. So that gives you Vari. We see a lot of common words abbreviated in typical ways for Old Norse manuscripts. Eða meaning or, swa meaning so. These are such common words that they have standard abbreviations in these manuscripts that allow the scribe to take up as little space as possible. Then we have little things like how um, a bar or macron over a vowel indicates that an M or M has been left out over after it. So that's what you see there in Mon, which we would show in standardized classical Old Norse as M-A-N-N. -N. But notice too that the word preceding that on the line just above it in the manuscript, Mildan, that does not have two N's at the end in classical Old Norse. It just has one N, but it's written with a capital N, which is another way of showing that there are actually two N's, right? So you can write capital T to show there's two T's, right? Capital S shows there's two S's. So this dub, this capital N shows there's supposed to be two N's, but that's actually an error on the part of the scribe, who's probably being influenced by the two N's at the end of the next word, mon. Remember that these scribes are not necessarily very interested in what they're copying. And even if they are, it's boring, repetitive work, much more so than typing or even writing with a you know ballpoint pen today. And uh, they're going to slip now and then and make mistakes. So do I show that to you on the, the uh, printed page? I would say that that's actually not useful for the purposes of most learners of Old Norse or even most readers of Old Norse who want to know what the text quote unquote says without the abbreviations and without the potential uh, errors of the scribe. But there's one really glaring error in this particular stanza of Havamal, which is where we've got this word that looks like in the manuscript, in the third line of the stanza in the manuscript, it looks like swoki. By the way, notice that that is that old fashioned long S that you still see in like the Declaration of Independence. It looks more like an F to our modern eyes. Ought I to reproduce that as a long S, or can I turn that into a normal looking S for us? I'd like to think I could turn it into a normal looking S for us, but some people might be that picky. Okay, but what is this swalky? We know from the meter that there's got to be, a, obviously this isn't printed in lines in the manuscript, which is its own interesting question, right? Um, some people turn this stanza into, uh, what would that be? One, two, three, into six lines versus, well, no, some people turn it into three lines. It's the English or German editor way. Some people make the six lines as the Scandinavian editing way, which I follow. Um, but notice that it's not in lines in the manuscript, right? They're just trying to cram it in. So this would be the fifth line of a Leo the Hotter stanza in Old Norse. And we'd actually expect, um, you know, check out my video about Leo the Hotter for the details about this. But for simplicity's sake, I'm going to just say we'd expect three syllables here. What we've got is two. And what we've got is this swolgi, which isn't a word. So what's going on here? What it looks like is our probably sleepy scribe has written swa and then started to write the beginning of a word starting gi or gj. They don't distinguish i from j or u from v. Most editors, myself included, think that the context of this line, which is about uh, giving in exchange for giving, means that this is swa so followed by an adjective that means something related to giving, right? Something related to the root, not, not root, but the noun of gift. Um, and so we fill it in that way. So for example, I fill in gjovlan, giving or generous, which is also what most editors fill in there in the masculine accusative singular strong. Now, I am picky enough, persnickety enough, that in my Old Norse text in the Wanderer's Hall of Mall, 
I put the part that I'm filling in there in brackets. But not everyone is going to do that, and in fact, I would say that most text of all model norms that you're going to find are not going to show you that that's filled in. And people are going to fill it in different ways, too. But what word goes there? Yovlan isn't necessarily right, but it certainly fits in the context. My translation of the stanza uh, in the normal Hovmal, not the cowboy Hovmal uh, translation, is I have never met a man so generous nor so hospitable that he would not welcome repayment, nor have I met a man so giving that he'd turn down a thing offered in return. Now, one more thing that I'll point out here is that very last word in this stanza, thegi. In standard modern Icelandic, or standard classical Old Norse, which is based on Old Icelandic, that would be thiggy, right, the subjunctive present third person singular of thiggya to receive, which uh, you can actually see thiggya uh, to receive earlier in the stanza. So what is thiggy? That is a known dialectical form of the present third person singular subjunctive of they gave receive from Norway, and Hovmal contains a lot of Norwegian provincialisms, regional forms. I leave it as it is because I think that those Norwegian regional forms are very interesting, but you will find editors who will correct that, correct, I mean, change it, standardize it to Thiggy. Who's right? Well, if you're learning standard classical Old Norse based on Old Icelandic, Thiggy is going to be easier for you to read, but with a commentary like in My Wanderers Hovmal, you can find out what Thiggy is, and uh, then it's not some huge challenge. So these are some of the big questions that have to go into every single stanza of a printed Old Norse text. It really is about as much work as the English translation is. And people are just as possessive about it, right? I can't take someone else's edited text of Hovmal or the Saga of Herbert and Heydrich or what have you because they've put in a lot of work to decide what that ought to look like. And I have to put in that work myself to present it to you. Now, having said all this, looked at what it takes to edit an Old Norse text and really just a tip of an iceberg with one stanza, I'm going to give you a quick word from my sponsor and I'm going to come back and talk about a few more considerations for why this translations, and most translations by other people too, don't include an Old Norse text and uh, some thoughts about finding that Old Norse text yourself. Now, I've got to say that it strikes me the wrong way a little bit that uh, when people ask me, as they inevitably often do, especially around when a new book is being released, whether the book includes the Old Norse text in addition to my translation, and I turn it around and I say, do you read Old Norse? The answer is almost invariably no. <laughs> so, you know, people don't seem to be looking for the Old Norse to read the Old Norse, they seem to be looking for it mostly for sort of decorative purposes or sort of totemic purposes, right? Maybe um, they, they find some badge of authenticity there in the Old Norse, even if they can't read it. Maybe they have a uh, exaggerated idea of, I don't know, the sort of sacredness of the language, an idea that I don't buy into, right? Language is language. It's a means of communication. There's nothing particularly golden lettered <laughs> about the original Old Norse. But if you're looking at the original Old Norse as a source of information rather than decoration or, I don't know, sort of authenticity by association, you can find the Old Norse text pretty easily. It's not hidden in a vault. You just have to keep in mind that what you're going to find is going to be somewhere on the continuum between scans of the original manuscript, which you can find at handrit.is, it's not that hard, and very edited texts that are going to be very edited one way or another. If you don't want to try to read the manuscript yourself, you've got to trust someone to edit it for you. And again, we're possessive about our edited texts, right? Everyone has his own or her own who has worked on these texts. 
Now, I was willing to go that far with Havamal, a text that I am very familiar with. Um, and of course, I have done a sort of first draft edited text of the Old Norse of many other Eddic poems on a series of videos that I've done. It's just in a playlist called The Poetic Edda on Old Norse, where you can find my kind of lightly edited, but still based on the manuscript text of um, the uh, Eddic poems, including Voluspal, Lokasena, Grimnismal, Vavdrutnismal, Horvarsljod, Rikstula, Baldrstramar. I've done a lot of them, and almost no one has watched these. <laughs> so people say they want the Old Norse text. Then I presented after heavy labor, right? Again, look at how much work it goes into just making decisions about one stanza, and nobody watches these. No one seems to want the Old Norse text for informational purposes. <laughs> If you do, you can find those videos, and uh, in them I explain not only what the Old Norse text says, but um, some of the difficulties with some stanzas, what I translate them to mean uh, more literally and then in a more finished format. Um, you know, those videos are some of the, I think, greatest resources that I've put together on my channel. So if you really do want the Old Norse text, there you go. Now there's other places to find the Old Norse text. The uh, the real new standard is the uh, Volumes from Islandsk Fornrit, which is a great series going back many decades, the Old Norse text of uh, many of the great original works of, of Old Icelandic literature. Uh, the sagas have been um, out for decades in some cases, but the, um, the poems of the Poetic Edda have only been out in an edition from Islandsk Fornrit for less than a decade, I suppose. Now, uh, the editors of that were Vest Vestaden Olason and Jonas Christiansen, and uh, that's two volumes, Edukvavi, or Modern Icelandic Edukvavi, one and two. And uh, those have commentary in Modern Icelandic, as well as professionally edited texts of all the poems of the Poetic Edda. An excellent resource if you read Old Norse and Modern Icelandic, which if you're getting serious about the subject, I assume that you're working on doing. And uh, if you've started working on doing that, or if you're thinking about working on doing that, the only book that I recommend for learning Old Norse uh, right now is a series called The New Introduction to Old Norse by Michael Barnes and Anthony Fox. Although if you already have a lot of linguistics knowledge, E.V. Gordon's older introduction to Old Norse is also very good. I don't know of other books that are good. That includes the one you're most likely to ask me about. Um, and I also have a series of videos about uh, learning Old Norse that take a little bit of a different approach. And I am, yes, working eventually on releasing my own book, but that's some ways away. Anyway, if you go looking for the Old Norse text, the definitive version today, uh, well, for Hothmall, I'd direct you to the Wanderers Hothmall, but for the rest of the Poetic Edda, I'd say, Go check out Etukvadi 1 and 2 by Vestaden Olason and Jonas Kristensen. There's also an excellent edited text by Gisli Sigurdsson, um, his own Etukvadi. Uh, Gisli takes a different tack than uh, Jonas and Vestaden. Uh, I often tend to agree a little bit more with Gisli's interpretations of particular things and, and, and how he comes down on particular controversies. Um, his edited text is not as close to the um, the manuscript, however, as he brings a lot of the spellings closer to modern Icelandic. His commentary is also in modern Icelandic. So uh, that is a good language to know if you are into this field. Now, online, if you don't want to spend money on texts, there is the great resource heimskringla.no. That has many public domain editions of the uh, original works of Old Norse literature, as well as public domain translations into the Scandinavian languages. And then some more recent ones that have just been done uh, by living people, um, including myself. There is um, my Nienorsch translation of Olaspaz there. It's a strange artifact. Um, the, the public domain editions of the uh, Poetic Edda that you'll find there include um, most findably Finner Jonsson's. Now, Finner Jonsson was an archaizer. He will take the Old Norse text and he will actually make it look older than it looks in the manuscript, almost the opposite of what Segisa Sigurdsson is doing in his Edukvadi. 
So for example, Finner Jonsson is going to take er, meaning is, and turn it into s, the more archaic form. Var, turn into vas, the more archaic form. Often takes the particle um and turns it into ov. All of these are to make the text look older than, uh, than the time in which they were written down, which was the 1200s. Now, I'm a firm believer that most of these texts do go back to an oral original from perhaps the 900s, but I think that it's most responsible to represent them as close to the language of the time they were written down as one can, because of course we're not entitled to, to recreate something else. We're entitled to, I mean, we're barely entitled to, but we at least have some rights to the text that's actually there in the manuscript. Um, now, those texts often do have real archaisms. Uh, Hovmald does include, for example, um, some, some S, although it's always abbreviated, it's just the letter S, not the whole word S. Uh, where that occurs, I will show it in my Wanderers Hovmald, but I'm not going to turn all the R into S, because then you're losing something. Uh, you're, you know, you're archaizing one thing, and there's so many other things that would be archaized. Um, you know, that'd be different in the 900s. You'd have nasal vowels and all this stuff. It just seems like opening a can of worms to, to artificially archaize one set of words and not just try to go whole hog and artificially archaize everything. So, you can find this stuff. You will just find it in either the bare manuscript form or the very edited one way or another form that reflects someone, someone expert, but someone's opinions. So... Here are the answers to that question again about why I don't include the Old Norse text in my translations. One, the Old Norse text takes as much work as the English. Two, it doesn't seem like the people that want it actually want it, <laughs> except for decoration for the most part. Um, although I'm certainly happy to continue doing uh, small texts with the Old Norse included. In fact, I'm working on another one with Hackett uh, in the very near future uh, for the benefit of, of learners and, and people who, who really want to seriously look at this language. And also, by the way, I think that people sometimes, when they say they want the Old Norse, what they mean is they want runes, but of course these texts aren't written in runes, right? Runes were not used to write long works of literature, at least as far as we know. We've never found anything like that, anything longer than, you know, the Rookstone. Um, you know, Volswell, Hovemal, they don't have an original form in runes because they were written down for the first time, almost certainly, in the Roman alphabet, which is what we have them written down in. And then also I'll point out that for the practical publishing side of things, it is twice as many pages to print the Old Norse text. That means you know, probably the price of the book might go up twice as much. By the way, it also calls in peer editing that is more difficult, probably, or at least more complicated than peer editing simply the translation, right? We have to get someone who knows Old Norse to check my Old Norse, right? And preferably two people, as with the Wanderers Hall them all, to check it and make sure that I'm not, you know, grotesquely misleading y'all. Of course, no one's peer editing these videos, but at least with the videos, I can correct things pretty fast and, um, you know, remake videos if they get just ridiculously out of date. All right, there you go. Check out from the manuscript to you if you want to know more about how manuscripts get edited. Check out those Poetic Edda and Old Norse videos. It would please me so much to know that all the work that went into those actually resulted in them being useful to more people. And I hope you'll check out The Wanderers of Mom, my favorite of my books. Um, it is, I think, the definitive Old Norse text of Havamal, and of course it includes my English translation, my cowboy translation, and um, uh, commentary. And for now, from beautiful Wyoming, let me wish you all the best.